guys, Nails by Vic face reveal. This is how I'm looking for the month of October. Here's the nails we're gonna be working on today. Oh boy, are those things scary. Look at that growth. <laughs> Here, show the camera better. Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you're new, make sure you hit that subscribe button and let's get right into this video. So today we have here Sister Spice. And you're like, well, we just saw Sister Spice like a week ago doing these nails, actually. It's Halloween time now and Sister Spice needs some Halloween nails. So today we're just going to be doing a fill-in because we're not going to take these nails off. We're just going to take off the design and start from there. So I think you guys will be pretty proud of me for my drawing I made. So I drew all of this myself, but I did get inspiration for some of these designs on like Instagram and Pinterest. We are going to be doing a My Melody and Karomi Halloween nail set and here's what i came up with i think it's pretty good drawing so for the my melody hand this is gonna be like light pink glittery cute halloween actually i'm not gonna be showing you the karomi side today because it's gonna be a surprise for the next vid because this is gonna be a two-part nail video so here is what we came up with um this is the thumbnail all the way to the pinky nail and we got a glittery pink base with some pink drips we have a heart airbrush nail with a little bit of blood drops and this is a ghost my melody thought it was really cute this one's gonna be a full french tip charm nail and then this one's gonna be another glitter nail with a spider web so that's the design for today so let me just show you everything that you're gonna need for this nail set okay for the poly gel i'm just going to use some of this nude poly gel from mccart this is just for one nail to fill it in and then the rest of the nails are going to be filled in with this clear and also we're going to use this glitter poly gel because the nails are going to be glittery pink next i just have this hot pink here but i'm gonna definitely mix it with white to make it a light pink and then we also have some glow in the dark gel polish we'll probably have to mix it a little bit because we want to do light pink but these glow in the dark so so they're gonna be cooler and that's pretty much everything we're going to need so we're just gonna get right into these nails because we're gonna be here a while let's see how high my frustration level gets oh yeah we're also going to need a lot of different nail charms but i'll show you that when we get to that part let's just get right into the nails okay so here are her natural nails this is what we're working with now the first step for this villain is going to be shaving down all of this design that's already on here yeah as you can see some of these charms didn't last very long which is sad but oh and look look what happened to our gold charms they're not gold anymore what what is this look at that one it's green it's green okay let's get to filing off this design so i just have my mccart dust collector here's the nail drill bit i'm gonna use i don't really know what it's called but i'm hoping that it'll take off all of the design easily i'm actually gonna pick off all the nail charms i forgot Okay, now let's actually get filing.
Okay, so I have all the nail design filed off and I also filed down around the cuticle area so that way it's nice and thin and I filed off any of the lifting that might be there. So now we're gonna do the nail prep. So I'm gonna push back the cuticles and do all that stuff. Next, I'm going to take this cuticle drill bit and work this around the cuticle areas. Now I'm going to trim off all the excess dead skin. Okay, so all the cuticle area is pretty much good to go. So now I'm just going to clean up the shape just a little. I'm just gonna file in the sides to make them a little less lumpy. Okay, so here's what we're working with for the base of these nails. Now we're going to add on some primer and dehydrator. I'm only gonna put this on the natural nail that's showing. Okay, now I'm going to add on a layer of base coat over all the nails. Okay, now we're going to get into this poly gel application. So I'm just going to be filling in the nails with some clear for the clear nails. And then the one nude nail is gonna be filled with this nude poly gel. So we're gonna get started on that. So all I'm gonna do is add a small bead of this to the cuticle area. And then I'm gonna get smoothing this out. I'm just going to push it towards the cuticle and then I could just blend it up with the rest of the nail. Okay, I feel like that's pretty good. I'm trying to keep it as thin as I can because I am going to be going over it with that other layer of glitter poly gel. I think this is good. I'm going to have her cure this in the nail lamp. Okay, so I'm going to do that for all the rest of the nails. And Sister Spice is going to get into these creepy Reddit stories. Hi guys, it's me, Sister Spice. So I have some spooky Halloween stories. And this first one is from the subreddit Ghost Stories. And the title is Real Ouija Board Experience. Brought 27 
seven spirits to my house. In 2017, five of my friends and I moved into our new house to find we weren't the only ones living there. We'd been looking forward to moving in for almost a year. Second year meant no more cafeteria food, dons, or public bathrooms. Only six friends living together. So I'm gonna assume that maybe they're in school and now they're able to move into a house together. We quickly made the house our home, decorating the walls and hosting a few too many housewarming parties. We felt safe, happy, and comfortable in our new place. Shortly after settling in, my housemates and I heard inexplicable sounds. We'd hear the shower sliding door move on its own, footsteps sounds from upstairs, and the front door open and close. We were suspicious of the sound, but quick to brush them off and continue with our lives. That was until the evening of October 25th. While all six of us were sitting around the dinner table, a pan on the stove began to rock back and forth on its own. We tried to play it off as normal, but nothing could explain the shaking. We decided we had enough. We had to get to the bottom of these strange occurrences. Ten minutes later, we lit a candle and set up our homemade Ouija board in the middle of our table. To use our Ouija board, each player lightly places one finger on the planchette, a wooden triangle used for these ceremonies, and questions the room's spirit. If one is contacted successfully, the planchette moves itself around the board and spells out the word or numbers to answer the question. Is anyone there? We asked the board. No response. We asked again and again, but still no response. After a couple more tries, the planchette dragged itself to the word yes. We were in on a piece of paper. Once we were sure that there was someone there, we continued to ask questions to find out who exactly we were talking to. What's your name? We asked. Slowly but surely, the planchette moved to the letters A, D, Y until it spelled out Adisot. My housemates and I continued to communicate with him for a few minutes until we felt we were no longer speaking to Adisot. We asked if there was another presence with us, and it turns out there was. This time, the spirit was named Pam, a three-year-old good spirit, according to her. Realizing there was more than one spirit with us, we asked the board how many there were in our presence. The planchette slid to the number eight. With news of our eight additional roommates in mind, we decided that that was enough for one night and stopped the game. After looking up the standard conditions of using Ouija boards, my housemates and I discovered we'd broken some rules with our first try. Ouija boards are supposed to open the connection to the spirit world, attracting and inviting spirits from all over. They shouldn't be played at home. If you play where you live and connect with malevolent spirit, it can stay in your house. Spirits can't be trusted. A spirit can take possession of any players and gain access to their mind. The next night, we decided to break out our Ouija board and play again. This time, when we asked how many spirits were with us, the answer was 27. After asking who is with us a few times, we compiled a list of names. Nudu, Verdu, Lukuf, Matt, Corey, to name a few. When asking whether or not they had good intentions, Nudu was one of the first to reply with no. I suggest asking Nudu if he'd taken possession of any of us. He answered no until it got to my housemate Emily and the planchette quickly swiveled over to yes. We put Nudu's answer to the test by asking personal questions about Emily only that she would know. How many concussions has Emily had? I asked. The planchette made its way over to the number four. We looked over at Emily who had look of horror on her face. Nudu was right. While Nudu answered the rest of the questions correctly, we couldn't rule out the fact that Emily's hand was on the planchette. Maybe she was purposefully or subconsciously guiding it in a certain direction. We told Emily to take her hand off the board but stay where she was. Then we asked, what is Emily's brother's girlfriend's last name? None of us knew the answer. The board replied, we looked over at Emily and she confirmed it. It was the right name. We were all in disbelief. A few of my housemates decided they were done playing and lifted their fingers off the board without even asking a question. The planchette moved to the corner of the board with only three remaining fingers on the edge of the of the shot glass planchette. We never could have made that happen on our own. Although that was the last time we ever played Ouija, the story doesn't end there. The following weeks were bad. My housemates and I were consistently uneasy in our home. We got especially nervous at night. We all felt as though we were being watched we saw dark shadows in the corner of our rooms and suffered from horrible nightmares. Emily would often wake up in the middle of the night screaming for help, convinced she saw a figure in front of her bed. One night while I was laying in bed, I heard a noise coming from the window, like someone running nails up and down the wooden blinds. After too many sleepless nights, we decided to hire a medium, Long Island Medium. We showed the medium around our house and told her what happened. Although we didn't tell her where we felt the dark spirits, she was able to identify the exact spots we felt their presence most. When the medium described the characteristics of the spirits she sensed, it was exactly the type of presence I'd felt. We'd all agree the spirit was an adult male in his late 20s or early 30s. He was a bit of a loner. 
Was this Addie Scott? She helped us remove the presents by lighting Sage and encouraging him to go towards the light. Go towards the light. Look for the light. We truly felt better afterwards. I no longer saw dark shadows in the corner of my room and stopped feeling like I was being watched at night. We thought the spirit listened to us, complied with the medium's instructions, and left. About a week later, when dropping off the payment for the session, the medium told us something that stays with me today. The spirit she'd helped us get rid of was now following her. Although this happened almost a year ago, there's still rarely a day that goes by where I don't think about these events in one way or another. The end. One of the comments said, You guys lifted your fingers? Of course you had problems. There's a whole ritual and set of steps to be completed to have a safe Ouija board experience. My partner and I communicate using the board frequently. It can be safe and educational if you go about it the right way. All the nails are filled in now. P Pinky, come on. P Next thing I'm gonna do is mix together some light pink gel polish. And I'm gonna mix in some clear top coat because we want this color to be a little bit sheer. Okay, so here's our color. Now I'm just going to paint on a layer of this on the nail. Is this what we want or is it too light? Are the two colors we created and this one's definitely better this one's just too light on the mixing plate it doesn't look like that so all right this is my next story in the subreddit creepy stories the title why i hate windows at nighttime does anybody want to guess what this one could be about i think it's gonna be about she sees some type of figure scary figure at night and yeah are you the author of this story you know i might have slipped this one in there this happened about a decade ago back when i was a kid living with my parents we lived on a huge piece of land that was mostly covered with forest our house was completely surrounded by trees it was nice because it meant we could be as loud as we wanted without disturbing anybody and our nearest neighbors were a pretty good distance away. The story I'm about to tell happened on a summer night. I was awakened suddenly in the middle of the night by a familiar ear-splitting shriek. It startled oh me. <laughs> it startled me so badly that I nearly fell out of my bed as my heart jumped out of my chest. I looked around the darkness of my room and saw my five-year-old brother, Ethan. He was flailing around in his bed across the room, kicking and screaming. I slipped out of bed and stumbled as I rushed over to the light switch and flicked it on, and almost instantly he stopped screaming. He kicked off his covers and scrambled to get out of bed. I looked into his face and could see genuine terror as he huddled closer to me, keeping his gaze fixed on the open window above his little bed. I turned him towards me. His eyes are wide and he's hyperventilating. What's the matter, buddy? What was it? I asked him. Before he could answer, my parents burst through the bedroom door. What the heck is going on in here? Roared my father, who always hated being awoken before work in the morning. It it's Ethan. I think he had a bad dream, I replied. My mother pushed past my father to come look at Ethan, who was still keeping his eyes on the window. She took him over to my bed and sat him down next to her. What happened, honey? Was it a bad dream? Ethan didn't reply. Instead, he motioned towards the open window. Did you see something out here, buddy? My father asked him, walking over to his window to have a look. It was a man. Ethan replied with a whimper in his little voice. My father, who is dressed in nothing except for his old blue bathrobe, rushed into the hallway and into his bedroom. I heard the door to his gun safe swing open. I heard the door to his weapon safe swing open. Alan! My mother called to him. You don't need to do that. He just had a bad dream. My father came back down the hallway and into his room, his big weapon in hand. Yes, I do, he replied. Why? Because the lock on the window has been broken. Someone tried to get in. You stay here, I'll be back. My mother, who is always so calm and collected, quickly rushed both my brother and I to the safety of her bedroom where the window was locked and another weapon in the safe. I remember feeling a sense of fear because my mother was never afraid of anything. We huddled together 
together in the room for about 15 minutes before my father returned. Well, what did you find? My mom asked. My father came in and leaned the weapon up against the closet door. Nothing, he replied, but there were footprints outside the window. Someone was there. Oh gosh, don't worry. I think our little man here scared him off. Didn't you guy? He said to Ethan, giving him a big pat on the back. Ethan was silent for a short moment. He just stared into space. He tried to get me, he said with a slight shakiness in his tone. The room went quiet. What do you mean, sweetheart? He tried to pull me outside. He was going to get me. My mother began to tear up as she pulled him closer to him. I think maybe the boy should sleep with us, Alan. She said to my father. Sure, hon. Nothing happened again after that night. My dad fixed the lock on our window and life went on. It's a story that still gives me chills whenever I think about it. A few days after it happened, I was walking outside with Ethan. I decided to ask him about the man that he saw, even though my parents didn't want me to bring it up to him again. Hey, Ethan, that man you saw, the one who tried to get you, do you remember what he looked like? I asked. He said nothing. Instead, he looked at me and did that creepy thing he used to do, where he folded his eyelids inside out and smiled at me. Ew. I never slept in that room the same way ever again. That's it. That's what the creepy man looked like. Mm-hmm. He said, you know what? Instead of letting me describe it, I can just show you. Let me show you. Yeah, what are your thoughts? That's definitely a creepy story, and I would not be able to sleep in that room, period. The dad said there was footsteps outside the window. Literally. And you want me to sleep in that room again? We got the base colors on, and I just did one layer of this sheer pink. You know, it is a little streaky, but I'm hoping with the glitter that it'll be covered up and you won't really tell, and all you can really see is the pink color. So next step, we're just going to put a really thin layer of this glitter poly gel on top of all the pink nails. And we're gonna get back into the creepy Reddit stories. Okay, so this next one is called to the man who tried to break into our house, let's not meet again. Posting this because for one, it's a scary story and I still get chills looking back on it. And for two, our dogs honestly saved our lives that night and deserve some more recognition. So this whole time this thing happened when I was maybe 12 and I'm nearly 17 now. Me and my sister, who was 14 or 15 at the time, were staying home alone while our parents were at our little brother's hockey game. We lived in a fairly safe neighborhood. Hardly anything ever happened. Everybody knew everybody and almost everyone got along well and liked each other. So we felt safe and didn't have a reason not to. Our front door was locked, our back door was locked, but our side door didn't lock. It was broken, but no one ever used it anyway. So my dad hadn't gotten around to fixing it. Er, even the more case to fix it. <laughs> Me and my sister were in the living room watching TV and doing homework. When we heard the fence around our house start making some noise, it sounded like someone had jumped over the fence. So my sister looked through the blinds and sure enough, someone had jumped over the fence. Two people actually. They were dressed in mostly black and had hospital-like mask over their face. We freaked out and hid in between the couches in our living room. When we heard the front doorknob wiggle, of course it was locked so it didn't open, but we knew whoever it was would go to the side door next and that one would open. In that moment, I was the most terrified I had ever been, but once the door handle started jiggling loud enough, my dogs had woken up. At the time, I had a Tosa and a Rottweiler. Once one started barking, so did the other and eventually it was pure chaos. That's when we heard them scream, oh poop, they got dogs. Then we heard the fence make the same noise as if someone jumped over it again. Later that night, a local gas station near my house got robbed by two armed men and the news reports showed the same people we had seen. Same outfits and everything, except this time we got to see their faces. Our dogs truly may have saved our lives that night. The funny thing is, our dogs are the biggest lovers. They may be loud and bark, but they wouldn't bite or attack anybody. This this is the one time I'm very glad these dog breeds are associated with being quote scary and aggressive end quote because clearly they scared off whoever wanted to break in that night. The end. Let's, On another episode of Dumb Robbers. <laughs> On another episode of Dumb Robbers. So the day started off really nice. I woke up in my stolen Gucci bag and then got out, unzipped the bag, got out, went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth with my Louis Vuitton toothbrush. I don't I wanna watch Dumb Robbers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this next one is called, I worked as a hotel night guard 
card and I have to follow these weird rules. I will be honest, it's giving, is that Freddy Fazbear? <laughs> <laughs> Come and apply at Mary Hotel. We pay $150 a week. I looked at the advertisement and thought about it. I didn't have much money, so I quickly applied. And after a few days, I received a phone call, ring, 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 saying I'm hired. I immediately went to the hotel and a man was sitting on the couch in the lobby. He looked at me and greeted me warmly. Hey there, welcome. I hope you work well. He then showed me around the hotel and gave me a guard uniform. I went to change and the man was gone. I knew what I had to do, so I just went to the security room. When I entered, there were a few surveillance monitors and a paper next to a phone. I looked at the paper and on the paper was a set of rules. Number one, do not look at camera five at 9 p.m. Bro, this is Freddy Fazbear. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Number two, at 10, 10 p.m., conduct a patrol around the hotel. If you see a man in the lobby wearing a suit, he will smile at you and ask, where are you going to? Do not answer him. Just ignore him and continue your patrol until 10.50 p.m. Number three, once it turns 11.50, your phone will ring, but do not answer it. Number four, by 12 a.m., you will hear knocking on your door. Hey, hey, sound effects, they're, they're scary. Just ignore it and continue your shift. Number five, at 1.30, you'll have to conduct another patrol, but you'll only have to patrol the basement. Once you reach the basement, do not look at the old rusted mirror on your left. Oh, you hear... great. How am I going to avoid all this? <laughs> if you hear growling, <laughs> <laughs> Quickly boot out of the basement and close the door behind you. After that, lock it and head back to your security office. If you do not hear growling in the basement, you may leave after 20 seconds and remember to lock the door. If you hear dripping noises at any point of time, do not even look behind you until it stops. Number seven, during 3 a.m. to 4 a.m., you will start to feel sleepy, but you must not fall asleep as you will be dead if you fall asleep. Number eight, at 5 a.m., those creatures will try to kill you and they don't want you out of here alive. So the power source will be cut out only to your office. And once that happens, crawl under your desk and close your eyes. You might hear your door open, even if it's locked. Just keep your eyes closed. Do not open your eyes and by 6 a.m. your shift is over and an alarm will ring signaling that it is safe to open your eyes and head back home. Anyways, thank you for working at Mary Hotel and we hope you enjoy your day. Right, so how can I quit on the spot? I laughed thinking it was a joke. So I looked at the clock and it said 9 p.m. So I looked at cam five <gasps> deciding that decision would make me regret. You, you know, I thought that they were gonna follow the instructions and be like, yeah, but I thought that they might forget one thing it's gonna mess it all up. But no, they, they don't really care. He I said, don't. these instructions are weird. <laughs> so I looked at camera five, but that decision would make me regret looking at the monitor. What I saw was red eyes in the dark staring at the camera as if it knew I was looking at it. I quickly looked away and sat down on the chair. Oh my gosh, I said to myself as I had broken a rule, but I just waited until 10.10 p.m. to conduct my patrol. When the clock strikes 10.10, I took a flashlight and exited the office. At the couch was a man in a red suit. I ignored him and just, I ignored him, but just as I was walking past him, I froze as he said, where are you going, young man? I ignored the man and finished my patrol. When it reached 10.50 p.m., after that, I sat back on my chair and thought to myself, why did I apply here? By 11. 50 my phone rang ring, 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 and I jumped but I just ignored it until the ringing stopped when it was 12 my door started knocking which made me froze for 20 seconds then ignoring it until the knocking stopped once the knocking stopped I heaved a sigh of relief Phew, Ray! <laughs> after that I waited until 1 30 where I left the office again and had to enter the basement I turned on my flashlight but it could barely illuminate the dark area and it sent chills down my spine just as I was about to step on the old wooden floor I heard a growling <laughs> And so my fight or flight kicked in and I ran. Just as I turned left, I saw a little bit of that rusted. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and I ran, but just as I turned left, I saw a little bit of that rusted mirror and all I could see was me, but hanged? I didn't care about that mirror and I just ran once I was out of the basement. 
I slammed that goddamn door shut and locked it away. I was running away from the basement door to the security office, and when I entered, I felt a sense of relief and sat down, but remembered that I had to be in the basement for 20 seconds or more. <gasps> Plus, I looked at the mirror, which left me paralyzed with fear, and I just stared at camera six and felt even more fear. When the dripping started behind me, I looked at the clock. It showed 1.59, so I waited. When it reached 3 a.m., the dripping noises stopped, and I also felt very sleepy, but I tried to stay awake until 4, which failed. So I laid my head down, and just as I started dozing off, something whispered in my ear, which made me jump. I looked at the clock, and it was 4.59. As soon as the clock hit 5, I quickly crawled under my desk and closed my eyes falling asleep until an alarm woke me up. It was 6 a.m. and I changed back to my normal clothes. I changed, finished, I left the area and headed back home. When I reached home, I sat down in my couch and kind of thought it was a fun experience until oh. my bedroom door creaked open. The end. Okay, so here's how the nails are looking after all the poly gels on. Now we're going to get into shaping. I just have my McCart dust collector and a hand file and yeah, we're just going to reshape these nails. are shaped now we're gonna get into the nail art so the first nail we're gonna do is the middle finger which has the my melody ghost on it and i have my color here i wanted to do a little bit of a darker pink so that way it wouldn't blend in with the background of the nail before i do the nail art i'm gonna paint on a layer of top coat for easy cleanup just in case i mess up okay now we're gonna get started on the ghost my melody i'm just gonna use this brush here that i have that i've been mixing my colors with and i'm gonna create the basic outline of the ghost. I'm actually gonna switch to the dotting tool. I'm gonna make the ghost bod. All right, guys, so I got another story and this one it has 16 parts in it. So it's gonna be kind of a longer story. It's titled, I am the framer of cursed images. I hate my job. I guess most people do, especially if they work retail. If you work the kind of soul-crushing retail that I do, you know what it's like. Entitled moms with bad haircuts, creepy old men with bad breath hitting on you, people expecting or demanding that you do things completely outside your job description and pay grade. Can you just such one difficult customer holding up a frame she found on the shelf and looking at me in disbelief she was shocked that i would dare to charge her just to put the graduation photo of her awkward looking son into it i'm sorry ma'am i said that's a service we offer we have to put you in the system and charge you for framing services we're very busy right now so it would be unfair of me to let you jump ahead in line when other people are waiting on their pictures to get frame two. If you'd like, I could show you how the frames come apart so you could just do it yourself. It's very easy. Fine, do that then. She placed the frame down on the counter and gingerly clutched the photo of her son, watching me like a hawk as I showed her how to undo the clasp, holding the backing on. Pulled the stock photo out, she slid the photo in, and before I could say anything, she snatched the frame out of my hand. Was that so hard? She hissed, and she turned and walked away. Okay, so I have the base of the ghost done and we're just gonna cure it's just the ghost shape no ears no arms yet so we're just taking this one layer at a time okay now i'm gonna add on the ears and the little arm nub and no it wasn't hard but getting rid of her was the goal anyways and now she's gone so i felt okay about it as she approached the sales counter at the front of the store to pay for the frame she turned to me and scoffed 
Ugh, if you're so busy, why did you have the time to argue with me anyways? I sighed and looked down at my paperwork again. I had 83 frames to produce that week and there were four days left. And on an average day, I can produce 12. So according to corporate math, I was doing all right and didn't need to bring in extra hours. I'm sure this all sounds familiar if you work corporate retail. All in all, despite the heavy workload and the strange angry customers, it was generally pretty boring and repetitive. But after ugly graduation sun lady, another customer approached the framing department counter. She was a little strange looking for several reasons. I couldn't pinpoint like where she was from. Her features were exotic. She was probably Asian, presumably somehow, but Asian is pretty broad category. The thing is, I wasn't able to pinpoint her down any further than that. She could have been Japanese or Tibetan. She could have been Japanese or Tibetan or Indian or even Ukraine for all I could figure. She looked like all of those things and none of them at the same time. I tried to put it out of my mind, feeling that obsession this much over someone was kind of gross. Creepy, problematic, I thought with the mental snicker. I need to get this fixed, she said plainly, and out of nowhere, produced this enormous box. It's what we call a shadow box. A shadow box is like an ordinary frame, but the space between the glass and the artwork has been expanded. It's deep. The frame is usually about two inches deep, but they can go even deeper. This one had to be about three inches deep. Shadow boxes are usually made to house objects or artwork that require special protection or has a 3D element component. I recently put a customer's ornamental collection into a shadow box and I thought it'd be the most interesting item I'd frame all month. Then there was this, about 40 inches by 30 inches, hiding the counter beneath it, was this ginormous ornate silver shadow box frame housing an incredible intricate sculptural artwork depicting a blue skinned goddess with dozens of arms standing on a body. Some of the arms arms held several heads, some knives, she wore a necklace of skulls, and a squirt wrapped skirt. The entire piece was created from spun glass, fragmented jade, mother of pearl, bits of metal, and some gemstones, and other unidentifiable substances. She glistened and shone brightly in the anemic fluorescent lights. I was mesmerized. I was mesmerized. I couldn't wrap my head around what I was looking at. It looked simultaneously like it was made from invaluable materials, but also the cast off of ravens hunting for shiny garbage. It was the work of one patient amateur or thrown together in an afternoon by an expert, or assembled piece by piece in a sweatshop. Like its owner, it couldn't be pinned down. Is it Cali? I asked, trying to sound nonchalant and conversational, but my voice cracked and whispered. Hi, side note. Kali is like a mythological goddess, if you're confused, because I was. I thought he was naming the customer. Yes. Do you think it can be repaired? Of course, I breathed, losing myself in the gut-wrenching beauty of the image. I mean, we would first... I'd, um, I caught myself, blinked, forced my eyes away. Wait, where's the damage? She pointed at the bottom corner of the box, where a loose piece of mother of pearl laid by itself. Skimming the image, I quickly spotted where it had fallen from. It was supposed to be a seaside cliff in the background. Is that all? Yes, not a big complicated, right? You can fix it. Now, I want you to understand that I wasn't swayed by a beautiful woman in distress, nor by professional pride. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm really not, trust me. And it's strictly against policy to do repair work on a customer's artwork. We only frame it. So it was to my surprise that my mouth opened and a yes fell out. Writing up her order on the computer was an exercise in lying to a machine to make it down to what you wanted to do, and I felt like I was watching it all happen in a dysfunctional fuge. I charged for assembly slash disassembly and object mounting. We were supposed to be making all in-shop work six days because of our heavy volume, but I found myself telling her it would be ready tomorrow. I cursed quietly at myself in my head while smiling dreamily and taking her money. I was acting like I'd fallen in love at first sight, not with the customer, but with Callie, the artwork. She signed for the work and walked out smiling gracefully while I stood sweating bullets behind the counter with Callie in front of me. I carried the box back into the frame shop behind the counter, grunting a little. How'd she hoist it so easily? I couldn't understand. I'm a big guy and I work out, but this thing threatened to flatten me if it fell on me. I sat it down carefully on the work table, heaved it over its front and examined the back. I had other work I should have tackled first, but I knew this would probably take me a while and I had to have 
it ready by tomorrow. I cursed again and again under my breath, still unable to believe how foolish I was. Under the tape and paper, the backing of the frame was held in place with dozens of tiny nails. We don't use them anymore, but they're typical in older frames and had to have been removed carefully with needle nose pliers. Once the backing was free, I hugged the whole assembly in my arms and prayed under my breath after I turned it face up again. I heard something rattle loose, probably the chunk of mother pearl, and I felt a bead of sweat run down the side of my face. I lifted the frame and glass away from the backing and it came apart cleanly. There she was, exposed to air for the first time in probably decades. Callie's eyes seemed to catch my own as though she knew what I was doing and was sizing up my worthiness. I put the frame aside and took a minute to bask in her terrifying beauty. I tried to dredge up some history about Callie from memory, but wasn't sure about it. Wasn't she the consort of Shiva? Wasn't she fated to destroy the universe so that he could eventually remake it? It was fuzzy on details, but I knew that she was important and fearsome. This artwork captured that perfectly. I put on some nylon gloves and carefully lifted the piece of landscape that had fallen loose. It looked pretty simple. The background was painted wood. I just needed to dab some silicone glue to the background and set the part back in place. Then let it dry overnight and resembled the frame in the morning. An easy client. Probably even still have time to do a few more orders before I left. So that's what I did. And at first, everything seemed to be going smoothly. I set the mother of pearl back in place and stood back to have a good look. It didn't look right. It wasn't in the line with the horizon, making it look like the water level was off kilter. I reached forward to turn it just a few degrees, studying myself with the other hand. How I messed this up so severely, I'll never understand. I thought I was putting my left hand down on a piece of bare background, but I was wrong. I put my left index finger down on Callie's knee and I instantly heard a snap. I swore and felt my eyes tear up, but I knew I couldn't stop what I was doing or things would just get worse. I finished adjusting the mother of Pearl Island, blinking away tears, and saw that it looked perfect now. Then I looked over to what I had broken. The blue glass of Callie's leg had broken fairly clean, actually, but it would never look the same. I lifted it slowly, holding my breath to get a better look. I could fix this, I thought to myself. The crack would be visible and I would need to explain to the customer and probably give her a refund. But as long as I fixed it and gave it back in one piece, maybe she wouldn't sue? We don't do repairs because we have no insurance for it. Very slowly and deliberately, I returned the shard of blue glass back to the lake. I see how it would attach. Somehow on the way back, my thumb brushed against the delicate metal of her skirt and I felt something come loose. I stopped breathing again feeling like I would probably scream if I opened my mouth. I looked closer to that metal piece I had knocked loose. It was actually a severed arm. Her skirt was made of them, to match her necklace of severed heads. In my imagination, it was Callie herself warning me that I would lose my own arm if I wasn't more careful. Pause on the story for like two minutes. I gotta do this line art and when she talks, she moves a little. So we have to be completely still. So pause on the story. Here's how my melody turned out. I stopped, stood back, and thought it through. I needed to plan this out, and the tools in the shop wouldn't cut it. I went into the store's proper... We're an art supply store, so we carry the things I would need. I bought a pair of rubber-tipped tweezers and a tube of super glue, paying out of my own pocket out of guilt. I went back into the shop and went about fixing the mistakes I made. I applied the super glue carefully to the blue glass and held it in place with the tweezers. And once it was set, the crack was barely noticeable. I breathed a sigh of relief and went about repairing the arm. As you can probably guess at this point, 
things didn't go well. It looked like it was going to be okay, but I was so tense and nervous that my arm slipped and my right wrist fell right onto Callie's face. I don't cry much. Before this night, I think I probably hadn't cried in years since my mother passed away, but the tension was so high and my unexpected attachment to this artwork so sudden that I couldn't hold back. I let out a guttural yell and just started bawling openly, still so concerned with the artwork that I averted my face to the side to avoid any tears landing on it and wrecking it further. Janice, the cashier on Till, came into the back to see what was going on. She found me there with the broken goddess in front of me, crying like a little kid and wasn't sure what to say. Are you all right? She asked, sounding stunned. No, I replied, shaking my head and wiping my tears. Anything I can do? No, this is just, I mean, I'll do what I can, but I think I'm in big trouble. Marion is going to kill me, then fire me, then probably kill me again. I laughed weakly. She awkwardly put a hand on my shoulder and tried to comfort me, which worked a little. Thank you. I'm going to try and, I guess, fix it? Okay, let me know if you need anything. Piecing the face back together is a bit of a blur. I remember it turned out better than I expected. My expectations were very low to start with. It didn't look great. Once it was done, I didn't even know what to look at. After my shift, I bought a 2-4 pack of soda, settled on my couch, and drank until I didn't remember. My phone had just enough juice to wake me up the next morning. The morning routine included vomiting, drinking two Gatorades, coffee at the drive-thru, crying again in the parking lot outside of work, and sulking towards the, the framing counter like I was headed towards my execution, and couldn't believe that my own two legs were taking me there. I had barely finished reassembling the damaged artwork when I heard the counter bell behind me. I turned around to see her standing there and I swallowed hard. I can't tell you exactly what I said. It was a rambling, apologetic, pathetic mess of words. She just stood there, unsurprised, unreacting. I said something about how sorry I was, how we usually don't do repairs, how I would give her her full refund, and like an idiot, I practically begged her not to take us to court. Her stoic, dark-eyed expression didn't change. May I see it, please? She asked calmly. I picked it up off the work table, brought it to her, setting it down gently on the counter. I, uh, the damage was, I gestured feebly at the face, the knee. It was obvious where the damage was. Her expression finally changed just very slightly. I could tell from my own mother the look of restrained disappointment. She kept trying to look me in the eye, but I couldn't bring myself to look back. She put her hand on the side of the frame. I'll give you a full refund, I stammered again. That won't be necessary. At the very least, let me wrap it up for you. That won't be necessary. I'm so, so sorry. I I felt tears coming from my eyes again. That won't be necessary either. Finally, I looked her in the eyes. There was so much anger and disapproval in those eyes, but also underneath it, all kinds of pity. I felt like I was looking into Callie's own eyes. Your karma will be brought back into balance. I'm not worried. You will repay what you have done and all will be forgiven. After the price is taken out of your soul, a long, deep breath passed as we looked at each other. I didn't understand what was happening. Are, are you gonna take us to court? I asked naively. She just shook her head picked up the box and walked out with it as though it weighed no more than a shade of paper. It was after that day that the cursed images started coming. A few days later, I was trying to put the whole incident behind me. I consoled myself by telling myself that I wasn't the first person to break a client's artwork, that she'd taken the situation really well, considering that I was in the clear now. I never told anyone what happened. Janice knew since she watched my breakdown that night, but she never brought it up again. Presumably, she never told our boss, Marion. I promised myself I would never Never take a client like that again. At night, when I closed my eyes and tried to sleep, Callie's face came to me, still cracked and clumsily glued back together. I didn't sleep much. The first couple of days, I fell even further behind and I had to start calling clients to let them know their orders would be late. The third day, however, I began to get caught up and things seemed like they were going to be okay. Veronica, who cut all of our framed pieces at our off-site warehouse, caught up as well. I began working in earnest, slicing up mat board and scoring glass more efficiently than I had before. Orders came together looking pristine and professional. That shift went by smoothly and I even began to forget about my guilt. It crept back though now and again when I realized that somewhere out of there was a blue goddess with a broken face in someone's house probably never to be hanged up on a wall again or maybe being taken to an actual restorer to be properly repaired. When I had these thoughts a tinge of guilt hit the pit of my stomach and I had to take a breath and focus on my work again. After all it was over. At 4 55 that Friday evening 
waiting five minutes before the end of my shift, of course, a new client approached the counter. I took a deep sigh and put on my fake customer service smile and mentally said goodbye to an early evening of relaxing with bad movies and cheap soda. On average, making a new frame order takes about half an hour, but most clients acted like it was a five minute process. I saw the stack of brown envelopes that she was holding and realized that it would be even worse. We had a series of frames to do. Hi there, I tried to say, but the middle-aged woman with big dark sunglasses and an asymmetrical bob cut interrupted before I could get that much out. I need these framed. How much will it cost? I looked down at the stack in her hand. I haven't even seen the items yet. For God's sake, let alone counted them. Measure them and settled on a design for her. That will depend on a lot of factors, I said, trying to sound cheery and helpful, such as the type of glass, the type of frame. Regular glass, she interrupted again. How much? I clenched my jaw and tried to relax it into a smile. Literally anywhere between $50 and $1,500. Why don't we have a look? Go through the options available and try to fit the design to your style and budget. She huffed and set the envelopes down. I put on my white gloves and opened them carefully, pulling them out smoothly to prevent any creases. It it was far too late for these old photos though. Some of them look like they've been stored on the floor of my car. I've had them for a long time. Never got around to getting them framed until now. That's fine. We'll, we'll make them look good, I promise. The first three were photos of a young man, including two awkward acne-coated school photos with a strange smile and much more relaxed and natural photos of him sitting on a rock beach in his swim trucks. He wasn't ugly, but he wasn't the kind of face you hang up all over your wall, unless you were his mother. They seemed like odd things to get custom framed and being standard 8x10 and 5x7 prints and her obsession with the price I assumed that she would end up buying a cheap plastic frame at Walmart. The third print however was not nearly as standard as I pulled it out of the envelope, I could already see that it was not a standard size. This one would require a custom frame. When I pulled it out, I let out an unintentional gasp. I've seen a lot of strange things in the last few years that I've been a framer, from kindergarten diplomas to war medals to wedding dresses, but I'd never seen anything like this. I'm going to fail to really describe this properly to give you the deeply unsettling feeling it gave me, but I'll try. The photograph was taken at night, poorly, using a regular camera with a built-in flash. It might have been a cell phone. Either way, there was clearly dust on the lens, giving the whole image an eerie, grainy, high contrast look. The scene was on an asphalt road in front of a club, I think. There was a line of people waiting to get in. There were vehicles parked on the road. Centered in the image was an old red truck. In front of the truck was the focus of the scene. Two men in uniform. They didn't look like police, maybe paramedics. One of them kneeling on the back of a thin shirtless man in blue jeans who faced down on the pavement. He was pulling the man's scrawny arms behind his back. The other uniformed man was kneeling on the ground next to him. Face turned to the camera, smiling, giving two thumbs up. The shirtless man face was turned to the camera too, but he was far from smiling. He looked blankly into the distance. He should have been in pain, but he looked like he might be too high to register what was happening. He was clearly injured. Blood covered half of his face and matted his hair. It took me a moment to realize that it was the face of the teenager in the other photos, aged by a few years and some hard living. Looking closer, I could see that there were, there were syringes lying on the road around him. My jaw dropped and I found myself staring into those big black circles of her sunglasses. She was staring at me expectantly. You can frame them, right? She asked impatiently. I closed my mouth and nodded. Grimly, I measured the photographs, the prints, and put the details into the computer. We went through options for molding like many people. She assumed that a thin plain black frame would be the cheapest, but I showed her a nice classic brown and black frame with some curves and detailing that was the same price. At the end, she was happy with the design and the price I quoted. I didn't ask about the photo showing the street arrest. I didn't know what to say. I did my best to pretend that it was just like any other normal photo that a normal person would frame. She paid and left, leaving me with the strange images. It wasn't unusual to call the floor staff over when I got an interesting artwork at the framing counter. Janice was working again that night, so when I saw that she was free, I beckoned her over. You're not going to believe this. I felt kind of guilty for sharing this shameful and incriminating moment, but I couldn't keep it to myself. That woman that was here, that woman that was just in here, gave me these photos to frame. Janice stared at the photos that I'd taken back to the framing table, then looked quizzically at me. Weird, huh? I asked as I prepared a sleeve to safely store them in. She shrugged. What's so weird about it? Am I missing something? I blinked in surprise. There are four pictures of her son, I take it. Probably, yeah. I don't see what's so weird about it. Looks like this one was taken at the reservoir 
far outside of town, she said, pointing at a rocky beach. What about this one? I asked, pointing at their rest scene. She shrugged. It's a neat old truck. My eyes went wide and my jaw dropped again. How could she not be seeing it? But what's happening in front of the truck? I demanded. She looked at me strangely again. She seems really uncomfortable now. It's just some guy posing with his truck. Big deal. Probably some farm kid. My jaw opened and closed, but I couldn't think of anything to say. I suddenly realized that whatever image she was seeing on the sheet of glossy paper, it wasn't the same as what I was seeing. The elements were similar, obviously, but whatever she saw was normal to her. It wasn't the depraved and abusive arrest scene of a junkie that I was seeing. Presumably, the client saw whatever she was seeing, meaning I was the crazy one. I just thought it was a really neat truck, I mumbled, thinking quickly. It was a dumb thing to say, but anything else to come up with would make me look even crazier. I packed up and went home, confused thoughts running through my head. Twice I found myself stopped at a green light and couldn't remember if they were green. When I stopped or if I failed to notice them turn. When I got to my small apartment, I grabbed a soda out of the fridge and settled into the couch. I intended to turn on the Xbox and load up something to distract me, but I found myself frozen. Had I hallucinated the arrest scene? Had I seen something that Janice and the client had missed? Were there two photographs in that envelope? None of the possibilities made sense. I passed out on the couch again that night and spent the weekend trying to forget what I had seen. I'm not much of a social person, but I contacted a few friends on Facebook and ended up inviting myself along to the bar on Saturday night. It was a pointless exercise. I sat in the corner, not saying much, nervously munching on my wings. I was trying to distract myself and it wasn't working well. As we exited the bar, I half expected to see an old red Ford truck and two paramedics tackling a shirtless junkie, but the scene didn't match what I'd seen. Monday morning came and I took the photographs out of their slot under the counter and opened the cardboard sleeve, storing the print. It hadn't changed. The young man's bloody face stared at me. It was so clear, so real, that I couldn't believe I was seeing things. I put it away and got to work, but a few hours later, I found myself staring at it again. I was scared to show it to anyone else, afraid that it would only confirmed that I was losing touch with reality. Tuesday passed. We were fully caught up now, despite the time I was inevitably wasting, pulling out the photo over and over again. On Wednesday, Veronica brought her delivery of frames. I almost brought her into the shop to show her the photo, but stopped myself out of fear. If she thought that I was losing my mind, she might tell Marion. Questions would be asked, my ability to do my job brought under question. It wasn't due until next week, and there were orders ahead of it, but I had to get the photos out of the shop. I found the four frames that Veronica had built, cut the glass, and matted the boards for them and assembled them carefully, trying hard not to look at the fourth photo. When I called the client, she was surprised at how early I had the work ready for her. She said she'd come by that evening and I decided to stay late so that I could hand them to her myself. She took her sunglasses off this time when she approached the desk and I was startled by the piercing pale green of her eyes. She suddenly seemed a little more human, a little less of a fearless nightmare customer, Karen. She handed me her work order and I smiled, my friendly customer service smile. I noticed my hands were trembling when I sat the wrapped frames down on the counter and began unwrapping them. You don't need to show me, she said suddenly. I'll just take them like that. She was avoiding my eyes now. I wonder if she was expecting to see the images I'd seen and couldn't bear to look at it again. It's standard procedure, I explained. We need you to sign off on the work to say that you've seen it and you're satisfied. She bit her lip and nodded, so I continued. I opened the first three photos, the normal one, and she barely glanced at them. When I opened the fourth one, I could see tears welling up in her eyes. I'm sorry, she said, choking back tears. These are photos of my son. He ran away when he was 16 and I haven't heard of him since. He took everything, all of my photo albums. These are all that I have left. I suddenly felt awful for my morbid curiosity and realized that I misinterpreted her attitude when she dropped off the photos. She hadn't meant to be abrasive. She was in turmoil. The photos had obviously brought up some heavy nostalgia and angst. She picked up the fourth photo in its new frame and smiled at it. It was disconcerting to see her reacting to some image I couldn't see. This is the day he got his old truck working again. He was a handy guy. He is a handy guy wherever he is. I hope he's okay. I doubt it. I couldn't say anything to her about it. She left with the four photos and I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. The photo of the woman's son being arrested during a junkie binge wasn't an isolated incident. Since I broke the portrait of Callie, they kept coming. I wasn't getting much sleep. I broke the artwork of Callie on Tuesday, September 3rd, and her owner announced the curse on me the next day. The first cursed image crossed my counter on Friday, September 6th. On Thursday, September 12th, two different cursed orders came in. The first arrived around 9.30 a.m. I know this because I was just finishing my morning paperwork. I remembered I was grouchy and sore from lack of sleep and overwork, and I had coffee at the counter even though this was 
was normally forbidden. As I saw the customer approaching, I quickly placed it on the shelf under the counter to hide it. I recognized him. He had come by about a month or two ago. I think he'd been framing something his son painted, making a good show of being a proud father. Although honestly, the painting was not that great. It was a portrait. Though it took me a minute to figure out what it was supposed to be an image of, the man standing before me. When he approached the counter, I had a moment of dread, thinking that he was coming back angry for a refund and that my sale for the day was about to be wrecked. Next nail is the pointer finger. So this one has the airbrush tarts. I'm gonna take some white airbrush paint, put that in there. I have these stencils here that I'm gonna use. Now let's get spraying on the airbrush, I guess. how the airbrush heart nail turned out. I think it turned out pretty good. Now I'm going to do the charm nail and just add all of the charms on the nail. Let me just pick out all the charms. But then I realized that he was carrying a new unframed painting, a returning customer, the best kind. They know what to expect and know how much it will cost. I don't think my soul could take another look of disgust at our prices. They're actually very reasonable, but people tend to underestimate the cost of materials and labor that goes into framing. And on top of that, people are generally cheap. I smiled up at him. I would have loved to greet him by his name, but I rarely bother to remember customers' names. There are so many, and I try to use my mental labor on more pressing things. I cringe when he addressed me by my name and I had to ask his to look him up on the computer. You did such a good job at the last one, he gushed as I pulled up his information. I decided I wanted to get as many of my son's paintings framed as I could. That's really sweet of you, I said back, putting on my best customer service voice. We take a lot of pride in our work. I was really impressed with this one, he said, pulling the 16 by 20 inch dollar store canvas out of his bag. My heart sank when I looked to see what he had set down on the counter. It was another portrait in the same style as the last one. This time a woman. The man's son was at the uncomfortable stage of learning where you can make reasonably good portraits, but they are far enough away from accurate that they give an unsettling effect. The skin looks stretched tight and shiny. The eyes don't quite line up. In this portrait though, you couldn't tell that the eyes weren't lined up because one of them was painted with a surprisingly well rendered swollen black eye. Just beneath the nose was bruised and disjointed, obviously broken and dripping blood. The worst part though was just underneath the woman's jaw was obviously broken too, sagging painfully on the left side. Her mouth was crooked and gaping open, revealing broken teeth. She looked like she'd just been hit by a train, but decided to pose patiently and calmly for this portrait. Or worse, that she was dead. I had to turn away quickly, trying hard to disguise my disgust and discomfort. I felt my stomach Eight. This wasn't at all like the gore of, of a horror movie. It was so anatomical, so realistic, I felt my own jaw ache. The man was looking at me, a little confused. I knew that he was seeing a different image, one where the portrait of his presumed wife was uninjured and smiling patiently. He's improving, I said, suddenly trying to cover the awkward moment. I mean, the first one you brought me showed some real skill, but he's getting even better. His smile returned. You think so? I think so too. I went through the molding options with him and we settled on one that complimented her eyes. We went through the usual process of payment, receipt, due date, and well wishings. The moment he stepped out the door, I walked swiftly to the front of the store where Jackson was working. He was stocking some shelves and hummed along with the music he put on. Jackson, I hissed, I need you to come to framing for a remeasure. He gave me that same look Janice had given me, the expression of confusion and forced calm that you'd give when you visit patients in a psychiatric psychiatric ward, but he followed me to the work table in the back, put on white gloves, and grabbed a tape measure. This one here, he asked, looks like a standard 16 by 20 to me. I just want to make sure, I lied. He hummed as he extended the tape and began checking the measurements. He was looking right at the painting, not reacting. Interesting artwork, huh? I said conversationally. Not bad. Pretty amateur, but shows promise. What do you think of the eyes? He shrugged. Not bad. He didn't add the life. You know, the little reflections that make the eyes look alive and moist? I I wanted to grab him by his shoulders and shake him and scream. How do you not see this? He painted his mother like he'd been slammed in, in the face with a two by four. 16 by 20, just like it looks. He set the tape measure down and took off his gloves. I just wanted to make sure. No worries, anytime. Anything else you need? I shifted on my feet a bit. I was craving some sense of normalcy. At that moment, I guess. How did your project go? Huh? 
Oh, you mean in the color theory class? Good. I handed in yesterday. I thought about your advice to go for a minimal palette, but then I noticed a lot of other students in the class were going that direction. I decided to do something different. Thanks for the advice though. Yeah, no problem. Good luck on that. Thanks. We stared at each other for a moment, unsure if there was anything else to be said. Um, I'll be at the front if you need anything, he said and walked off humming. I put the painting away in the cardboard sleeve, grateful to not have to look at it again until it was framed for arrival. The reprieve didn't last though. After lunch, the third one arrived. The woman seemed very somber and stressed, a haunted look in her eyes and a tendency to check the time on her phone fairly regularly. She came to the counter with a large brown envelope, the kind you get from the print shop. You do framing here, right? I felt like making some kind of smart remark, but I caught myself. She was definitely not in the mood for humor. We sure do, I said hopefully. What do you have for us today? She pulled the photo carefully out of the envelope and set it down on the counter. It took me a moment to recognize that I was looking at another one. This photo was a scene in a forest in fall. There was a man standing next to a shed, undoing a combination lock. He was surrounded by a pale aspen tree and golden leaves. It was kind of stunning for a second until my eyes settled on the shape on the ground at the man's feet. There was a lump shape tied up tightly in a blue tarp. It would have seemed fairly innocent until I noticed the arm and head sticking out of the tarp. She was dark haired and deathly pale, obviously dead, her complexion gone, her arm stuck out of the tarp next to her head, unnatural angle, and her eyes and mouth were wide open. I made eye contact with the woman at the counter. It's my dad. He always loves hunting. I don't suppose you can have it ready by Tuesday? His funeral is Wednesday and we wanted this photo by the casket. I swallowed hard. I did some quick mental calculations. Yes, Veronica hated rush orders, but we were caught up and could do it. I'm sorry about your loss. Sure, we can have it ready by Tuesday. Let me take a photo to put it in the computer and we'll pick out a nice frame to go with it. As before, the image on the computer screen matched what I saw, though when I turned the screen to her, she continued to see the real image, presumably of her father holding his weapon and standing next to the deer. No matter how I squinted or stared, all I could see is him about to stow away some young woman's dead body in the shed. I took her payment gave her a due date and called Veronica right away with the measurements and molding type. She sounded irritated as usual, but she said she'd start on it right away. Now alone, I opened the order back up on the computer and stared at the photo again. It seemed so real, so detailed. My eyes traveled over and over the scene trying to pick out details that would reveal the hallucination. How was my brain lying to me like this? Had I actually lost my mind? Finally, I caught it. I noticed the important detail I ignored before. There was a number in the bottom right hand corner written with fine point marker in tiny writing. I had assumed it was a day before, but now I was paying attention, I realized it couldn't be. It was 143218. That couldn't be a date, but it could be a combination lock code. I realized that this image wasn't a hallucination, it was some kind of message. After making sure that nobody was nearby to interrupt or catch me doing it, I opened my browser and started searching for missing persons. It took a few minutes to find the photo on the website of the police station of a few counties away. Way, but instantly, I knew it was the same face. I jotted down all the important information on the sheet of tape, and as soon as my shift ended, I hurried down the street to one of my few actual working payphones. I slammed three quarters in and dialed. Wheatland County, RCMP, how can I direct your call? Hi there, I don't want to stay on the line longer than necessary, so please grab a paper and pen. I want to make an anonymous tip about Andrea Nuren. I think I know what happened to her. I spilled it all. The last name of the man in the photograph, the description of the scene, the combination of for the lock. I could hear her writing furiously on the other end. How do you know all this? She asked. I had a vision at work. I didn't say, I just hung up. I don't normally follow the news, but when the story broke about the eight bodies found wrapped in blue tarp in a hunter's shed in the woods and the suspected murderer being identified as the recently deceased father of my client, you didn't have to follow the news. Everyone was talking about it. By September 16th, I wasn't sleeping much. News about the murder of Andrea Nuren was just starting to prelocate through my news feed bubble. Part of me felt pride for helping to solve the case. Part of me just wanted it to be all over. I had the uneasy feeling that they would just keep coming. First thing this morning, a woman came to my counter asking for an 11 inch by 16 inch frame. That's not a standard size, but we can build it for you custom. Do you have the artwork with you? It felt like such a practice line that I could repeat it in my sleep, which was a good thing considering that I felt barely awake. What? No, it's at home. It's not an artwork. It's a photo of my youngest son. He still lives back in India. He's an engineer. I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. Okay, we can do an estimate without the picture, but I can't give you a proper price unless I can measure it. 
I know how to measure, she snapped. It's 11 by 16. How much? Well, that depends on which features you choose. Having the picture would help us decide, but I just want to know how much. How much for the frame? That depends. Why don't we put together a design and no, just how much? How much to frame it? Between 50 and $5,000. I snapped back, losing my patience. Which frame? What kind of glass? Three mats? Two mats? No mats? Fillets? Who knows? I can give you an estimate if you help me choose, but with all of this, I gestured at the wall of molding samples behind me. It can be almost any price you want it to be. I just want to know how much it would be. $361.77 god dang freaking cents. I yelled, finally done with this conversation. She stormed out, nearly running over a poor August in her fury. Don't come back without the photo. I yelled at her and slumped into the framing shop. August turned to look at me, dumbstruck. I took some deep breaths and buried myself in work. Veronica had stopped by late last night with the latest collection of frames including the bland dark stained wooden frame that matched the eyes of the woman in the painted portrait. I pulled out the artwork in its cardboard sleeve and took the deep breath before opening it, hoping that reality had turned to normal in the last few days. Nope, there she was, badly bruised eye, broken nose, dislocated jaw, realistic blood, matted hair, busted teeth. I tried to avoid looking directly at her. Instead, I concentrated on the frame. I applied Alum aluminum backing, sealing tape, and adhesive rabbit foam tape to the inside to ensure that the artwork would never touch the frame itself. I turned the painting over mercifully, hiding that face, and lowered it gently inside. I was using a handful of offsets to fasten the frame to the painting with screws and cordless drills when I heard a gentle knock at the threshold to the frame shop, and I was just about to jump out of my skin. It was August. She looked of motherly concern on her face. Are you doing okay? She asked gently when I stared dumbfounded at her. She added, you seemed upset earlier. I stared at her for a moment, wondering how to reply. I felt like we barely knew each other as coworkers, but I suddenly wanted to pour my heart out to her, to tell her everything about the horrible things that I'd seen, about the recent revelations that were connecting somehow to reality and the uncertainty I was feeling about what I was supposed to do, but I couldn't. Janice told me about blue glass painting. If that was what's bothering you, she offered. Blue glass painting? I asked, lost. She said it was big, some sort of weird woman with lots of arms. This probably will strike you as ridiculous at this point, but I hadn't made the connection between the ruined artwork and the strange things that I've been seeing. So much has happened at once that I hadn't stopped to put all of it together. It probably doesn't help that I hadn't slept more than three hours or so a night for over two weeks now. August must have seen my eyes go wide at the point, but misinterpreted the meaning. It's okay, she said quickly. She didn't mean to gossip. We're both just worried about you. I know I'd be pretty shaken up if I, I mean, if a customer's artwork broke like that. It would have seemed impossible, really. I pride myself on being a very cynical, skeptical kind of person. I don't believe in curses or karma or anything like that. But now I realize that something really had happened a piece of my karma was taken away by what I'd done. I was cursed and it was causing me to see other customers' artwork as strange prophetic images. I don't want this, I thought suddenly and nearly said it out loud. I could feel my eyes filling up with tears. Hey, it's okay, August said, misinterpreting my reaction as guilt over the broken Cali. And actually, that wasn't far from the truth, but the reason wasn't exactly the same. She was putting out her arms to offer me a hug. I cringed, taking a step back. N no, I mean, thank you, but, but it's okay. Yeah, I'm still pretty shaken up, I guess. You sure? Okay, if there's anything I can do to help, let me know. Thank you. I think if I get some work done, that'll help take my mind off of it. Okay, I understand. I'm here if you need me. I was barely listening. The reality of my situation was finally hitting me. I remembered being a total mess on the inside, but on the outside, I kept putting these screws into the bland frame with the terrible painting. I had moved on to the next order, a non-cursed but still boring crisscross stitch in an equally bland gray wooden frame. I heard someone clear their throat behind me, and I just about jumped out of my skin again. It was a customer at the counter. I swung around, nearly dropping the box of pins I had been carefully using to stretch out the cross stitch. Sorry, I was lost in my own world there. I hope you weren't waiting too long. I could feel my usual good customer service mojo returning. Not long, said the tall middle-aged woman. She seemed harmless enough, like a regular middle-aged woman with boring brown hair, glasses that were too big, and a frumpy plaid blouse. She was carrying a block of wood when I looked at her closer. I realized it was a wood panel like a stretched canvas, but with a wood painting surface and instead of fabric. It wasn't very small, 
about 9 by 12 inches. She sat it down on the counter facing me and I felt my heart leap up into my throat. The painting was of a man crouching unnaturally like an animal. At first I thought he had long reddish beard but then I looked closer and saw that his entire lower jaw had been ripped away. His wide eyes with their two white scleras were the kind that seemed to follow you around. The painting was dark and crude like Goya's Saturn devouring his son. I looked away from the painting and saw that the customer was looking apologetic. Sorry, I should have warned you, it's fairly gruesome. I collect macro art, stuff like this and memento mori. I've got quite the collection at home. I give tours on Halloween. I breathe a sigh of relief, trying not to make it too loud or obvious. So it's a painting of a man with his jaw missing Yes? She looked at me funny, probably wondering why I was describing what we were plainly both looking at. Yes, I hope you're not too uncomfortable with it. My previous framework closed shop and I wasn't sure how easy it would be to find a replacement. It's not a problem at all, I said happily and started showing her the options. I was starting to wonder if the curse had run its course. Now that I'd seen three of the pictures, I was feeling optimistic as I finished the transaction and took the jawless man to the back. So I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary when a man in his mid-twenties walked in next, came straight to the framing counter, beaming ear to ear and unrolled a certificate in front of me. I assumed at first thought it was his degree but when I looked down to read it I saw that it was actually a death certificate hi there he said cheerily I stumbled for a moment over how to respond. I figured I had to be seeing things again, unless he really hated Jason Sutton, according to the paper. Well, congratulations, I responded unevenly. Thank you. I just got it last week. My mom insisted I frame it right away. Your mom's smart. Most people forget about it, lose the paper, and then decide to frame it when it's already creased and ruined. This one looks pristine. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. Don't have an office to hang it in yet, but that'll come. For sure. All right, I'll add you to the computer so that I can start the design for you. Last name? Sutton. I typed it in, feeling sweat forming on my brow. First name? Jason. He laughed at pointing at the paper, just like it says. Oh, uh, of course, right. I gave a forced laugh a little. As we went through the options, I tried not to look too closely at the information on the certificate. I couldn't help it though. Date of death, September 24th, 2019. That was just over a week later. I managed to keep my facial expressions and tone of voice under control as we settled on a design and I rang him through. The cause of death section had a lot of medical jargon like transection of sub-calvin vein, perforation of heart, and stab wound. Made things pretty clear. I stretched my face into a faker smile than anything I performed in customer service as I wished him a good day and took the paper to the back to file it away. I felt like I was going to be sick. I managed to continue working somehow despite the fact that it all felt so irrelevant suddenly. There was a good chance I would finish framing that death certificate before its owner's time elapsed and maybe he would even come to pick it up before that came true. I believe now that it would. Having learned what came of the hunter in the woods with his shed full of young women, I made it to the end of my shift, got in my car and started driving mindlessly home. It was a chilly day and I knew that my car would just barely be warming up as I pulled up to my apartment building. This was what's going through my mind when I approached the train tracks. The lights start blinking and the crossing arms lowered as I approach, just in time to make me stop. I cursed under my breath in a annoyance. No real reason, actually. I wasn't in a hurry, just irritated to have another obstacle between me and my sodas and video game. As my car came to a full stop, I noticed the woman who had also came to a stop on the other side of the tracks. She was on foot wearing a beautiful long brown leather coat. Something about it looked familiar, which made me look a little closer. She was looking towards the oncoming train to her left. Her graying hair blowing in the wind, she had a very stoic, determined look on her face. She turned to look the other way, and as she did, I noticed her striking golden brown eyes eyes. My heart sank as I realized who it was. I recognized her from the painting. I might not have made the connection, but the brown coat and those brown eyes were a perfect reproduction. This was the woman whose son painted her portrait, which I saw as distorted and broken, but everyone else saw whole. I felt my right hand hesitate over the gear shift just for a moment, and my left hand reaching for the door handle. I wasn't entirely sure why I was doing it. She turned again, this time to look directly at me. That determination was still there, but then she began to smile. A look of relief washed over her as she stepped forward, just as the train arrived. Then she was gone, flung so hard and so far that I never saw any part of her again, and I was left sitting there in my parked car screaming. That's the end of part four, y'all. Do you know who he recognized? The son's painting? Doesn't the kid draw paintings? And the, or 
guy saw that. Yeah, that she looked like she had bruised eye. And that was that lady mm -hmm. in real life though. Okay, next step, I'm going to finish these off with some cuticle oil. All right, that was the end of part four out of the 16 part story. Um, I hope you guys are liking it. That's the end for me now until the next nail video and then we'll finish the story. And here are how the nails turned out. Let us know what you guys think of this nail set in the comments. So I honestly really love how these turned out. I feel like they're really good pink My Melody spooky Halloween nails. I think these are so cute. What do you think, Sister Spice? I love them okay let me give you a nail tour first off we got pointer finger here with the airbrushed hearts with blood drip i think the blood drip really set the tone for some spookiness i think this is a really good nail and honestly might be my favorite next we got the ghost my melody then we have the charm french tip nail and then the pinky nail with the spider web and knife the knife was kind of like a last minute decision but i feel like it really filled up the space nicely and yeah it just adds even more of that halloween vibe to the nails and then here's the thumbnail pink drip with some sparkles you're going to die in there don't say i didn't warn you i know things okay now we gotta get to the part that we're really excited for the glow in the dark so the glow doesn't last too long but still you get the idea so the my melody ghost face glows and her bow and the spider web and the blood on the knife. I didn't make these blood drops on the heart nail glow in the dark, but I wish I did, but I wasn't really thinking about that. And also the thumbnail glows in the dark. Pink drip and some sparkles. Okay, so that is pretty much it for this video. We hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll talk to you guys in the next video. Bye!